Right, I hope you enjoyed part one, which was absolutely brilliant. Now, welcome back to part two, the interview with Martin Jones. And if you don't know who Martin is, he was drum and bass uh, producer and DJ, Goldie's manager from 1984 to 1990, who helped organise hip-hop events in the West Midlands in the early 80s. And he was basically like the Joe Conzo or the Jamel Shabazz of the UK, who documented some amazing early 80s hip-hop photography. I mean, his, his photographs are on the next level. And in part two, we're going to talk more in depth about graffiti art, also about Goldie's graph crew, the Supreme graffiti team, and the Wild Criminals. We're going to be talking about Electro Rock from 1985, the Rap Attack, as well as talking about key photographs from that magical era. So whatever you do, please like, comment and subscribe to this channel and share this history because the history being unleashed here you know is really important to the uk hip-hop scene and also go and check out part one and also we got part three is also coming very shortly so check out part three because that we're talking about goldie's trip to new york peace and martin did you uh what, a question i've got for you as well uh because we're talking about the breaking and all that now but let's talk uh, very quickly about the graffiti was there any kind of early graffiti going on from you know your neck of the woods um right so not that i was aware of not in the very early days <clears throat> of uh, of 83 but um certainly in wolverhampton it had started and, and this is quite a, a typical one this is by jasmine of um uh, Goldie's crew, and uh, this this is the, the wall to the station at uh, Wolverhampton High Level. So that that was quite an early example of it. This was well before Goldie formed his uh, Wild Criminals and Supreme Graffiti Team. Supreme Graffiti Team, yeah. What's that? Is that looks like a like some kind of dog as well, like sp sprawled out across the wall? Uh, yeah, Scooby Doo. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And obviously, going back to the uh, like the uh, the all days and all that, you know, I know that there was yeah. a there was a jam that you put on. It was called Thriller in the Park, which was in 1984, yeah. and there was some yeah. fierce, fierce battles going on. At Fr Can you tell me about Thriller in the Park? Yeah, um, th th this was the one I, I, I mentioned earlier, but um, it's uh, it was in the Roman style arena at, at, at Cannon Hill Park, and it. Uh, they repeated the event the following year, but this will give you an idea of the people who performed at the time. They that that was Future Shop. They were from Coventry. They were jazz boys basically, um, so they'd uh, perfected their craft at all days, but in the jazz room, and they did amazing athletic and synchronized routines. Um, but then you've also got. Uh, DJ IMD and uh, Raggedy the Tramp, and they had like a double act, which we developed for for TV a bit a bit later on. There was Mr. Riddles, who was a popper, and then we had um, these two, which was uh, Ian and Brian McIntosh, and, and they were double trouble. They were identical identical twins, and they did uh, synchronized body popping. And who's and, that the, right at the front? There was that Goldie and Birdie right at the front. Goldie, Lou, and Birdie, yeah. Um, but uh, this was, uh, we're jumping a, a year or so, but you can just about see the columns of the Roman style arena there and the steps. And then in front, you know, there was a huge sort of uh, battle area. And uh, we filled it with, I mean, I, I've got some, uh, some footage of it, but I, I think you can probably encourage people to have a look at the YouTube channel and they can see what the event looked like. But, and it happened about a month before the GLC hip hop uh, show at uh, Jubilee Garden. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was yeah. Up for me there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the GOA. That's obviously that was in London. It's where the London Eye is now. The GLC building was there. I went. To, I went to that in 1984. That was a uh, that was a that was a good jam. But uh, was was there any mad any mad battles at Thriller in the Park? Did you witness any crazy battles, Mike? Yeah, they, the 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 craziest one really was. Uh, they, they were both equally good, you know, it, Future Shock against Rock Six. Uh, and then, you know, about half an hour later, Future Shock uh, with, with the B-Boys. But it was a 12-man a B-Boys B with Hanifa, the, uh, the B-Girl, who she was the best B-Girl in the country. 
and, and the original B-Girl as well. And together they'd worked out some incredible routines, synchronized routines, but individually they were very good indeed. So um, yeah, both battles were, were really good. Yeah, and yeah. Like, I, like I was saying that the following year, Broken Glass against Supreme Rockers took it to uh, you know, a different level, not necessarily a better level, but it, it was a different battle, that one. Yeah, Bubble, Bubble, uh, Bubbles, uh, Hannifer was a wicked, uh, wicked B-girl. I mean, you know, there wasn't many B-girls around. Oh, there was uh, some early B-girls in London as well. But, you know, also Hannifer, you know, she, she was absolutely wicked on the dance floor. She had quite a bit of power as well. Considering she was a girl, obviously girls aren't as strong as guys. She was a brilliant mm. B-girl. Yeah, um, she was really the, the element that made uh, the B-boys stand out because there were a lot of crews and they were all they were all bro blokes uh, having said that the second crew that I had uh, the rough squad they were sort of the successors to to a squad and uh, we had uh, a girl called cosmic cam in there and she was a popper but she wasn't she wasn't a breaker so Hanifer was more or less unique in terms of doing you know all all the moves that the boys would do, the power, the power moves, mm. and the head spins. Um, so, you know, she was absolutely unique uh, in her day. Oh, definitely, and a big, big shout out to Hannifer as well. I'll take Hannifer in on this interview. Um, now, I've noticed it looks like a little GLC photograph that's just popped up. Yeah, that's it. Well, I took the. Uh, this is where the van came in useful because uh, I heard that uh, GLC were doing a big jam in Jubilee Gardens and I thought we ought to go um, so I at, at the time I think it was the uh, the ace squad in uh, yeah it was 84 September 1984 so it would have been the ace squad and we all we all got in the van and uh, we we went down and it was the first time that I really it dawned on me just how big hip-hop was uh, not just amongst youth, but in the country in general, uh, with thousands and thousands of kids coming from London, but also traveling like us from other parts of uh, parts of the country. It spread, um, I, I mean, mean, Martin, it spread massively. I mean, as you say, it was kind of like the Buffalo Girls that kind of was like the pivotal moment. But in 1984, you, knew, you know, you had films like Beat Street, Breakdance, you had the, uh, the book that come out called Subway Art. So that kind of propelled it to another level. Yeah, that's right. So I, I think a combination of all of those factors, uh, like you say, sub, Subway Art had come out in, in mid-84, I think, as Goldie showed it to me uh, when, I, when I first sort of met him. Um, so there was the Style Wars as well. That that, yes, that was in 85 when it Style Wars. No, I think it was 84. Um, that that I came out. I think in, uh, in it came out in eighty four, but I think it was televised in the UK in nineteen eighty five. Yeah, no, I can't be certain about that one. But uh, there, there were all these things that you know happening in the media. The scene was moving ahead uh, mm. at, at the all day as we were doing our, our youth work, and um, like I say, it, it just reached a crescendo of support and popularity um, at uh, well our event first, but. Then later, uh, <laughs> the DLT. Going back to, uh, well, going fast forward into 19, say March 1985, the, the film Electro Rock came out, which was bas basically, Electro Rock was a hip hop jam, which was filmed at the London Hippodrome. Can you tell me about um, Electro Rock, Martin, and your kind of, your involvement with it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Electro Rock. Well, um, I don't know who told me uh, that there was a film being made, but I got to hear about it and I sort of made a few phone calls to find out who, who was producing it. It's James Street Productions of Covent Garden. And uh, so I said, well, look, um, I asked them who they got performing at Electro Rock and it was London Group, London Group, London Group, um, Rock City. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't entirely... Uh, you know, London, but there was um, a bias towards, you know, L London performers, which is natural. If you're a film company, you know, you will first of all, you know, consider people on your doorstep. But it did rule out, you know, some amazing people who I was managing at the time. 
and that I knew about. So I offered to um, organise auditions for the, the Midlands Breakers. And um, so we, I hired the uh, Midlands Arts Centre Theatre and invited uh, B-Boys and, and Future Shop to come along. And some of, I think one of the, uh, the Rock City DJ came along to it as well. Um, so we, we held those in, in the theatre. Um, and the B-Boys actually got through, and Mr. Riddles as well, who's the, the popper. And th those were the two acts who came through. Yeah, obviously, um, you know, you had Broken Glass, uh, Rock City uh, crew, you had the, uh, the B-Boys, uh, obviously London All-Stars. I mean, it was a great, great event. Yeah, you were there, weren't you, Steve, in, in the audience? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was there. And uh, it wasn't just about the breaking. There was also a lot of poppers there. There was a Yankee and Sipo was on the beatbox. I mean, you, you know, yeah. I mean, pretty much everybody was there. It was a brilliant little jam. They, they made sure, and, uh, you know, help, I helped in this a little bit, I guess, but they spread their net a lot wider, I think, once, once they'd been up to Birmingham and they'd seen the talent that was available in the rest of the country. Uh, and I think the connections that London All Stars had with Broken Glass and with Rock City, you know, you know they ensured you know, people like Dolby would have got in touch with them and made sure that they they were represented too. So what you've got actually is a snapshot of the very height of of breaking at, in that particular era. Um, and I won't say it died off after then, but by 1986 it was quite difficult. You know, if you're talking about an agent selling a product, it became increasingly difficult towards the end of 86 to do that. So it was the, the high point for for breaking, really. And what we got to say, you know, all them crews, I mean, they was absolutely fierce at battling, battling other crews, but there was a mutual respect. And I'm sure Dolby and the, the other crew members will all say this. There was a mutual respect for one another. Yeah, that's right. Yes, it was fierce battle on the dance floor. Um, and then mutual mutual respect. Um, you know, you didn't admit it at the time, but you know, you would put the word around that that particular breaker was it, it did an incredible head spin or you know flares or, or whatever. Yeah. And, and also, what we got to mention as well, um, you know, Mike Allen. I mean, Mike Allen was he hosted that show Electro Rock, so. You know, big yeah. RIP to Mike Allen. He done a fantastic job at uh, Electro Rock. Yeah, uh, I mean, I wasn't really aware of his radio show, but I think it was uh, essential listening for anyone interested in hip hop sounds. Also, can you tell me about the uh, like the Kappa tracksuits? Yeah, um, flash to the ca Kappa tracksuits. Well, I had a, one or two strokes of luck at this point because I'd run football teams with a guy called Roger Newman and uh, his best mate ran an import business for tracksuits uh, supplying people like I suppose the JD sports of their day whatever the equivalent was uh, but he, he got all these rare tracksuits from all over the world and uh, Kappa was one of one of the brands so um, I just uh, he said well why don't you go and have a word with him and say tell him what you're doing and he may be able to sort you out so in terms of electro rock it was kappa uh, the actual performance at the london hippodrome but we later went on to um uh, approach uh, puma ourselves um independently and uh puma well i can remember the dancers in the van and we drove up to somewhere in lancashire which was their big depot and they couldn't believe it. They said, help yourself. So I, I don't know if I've got any of the photos here. Um, that, that's Kappa. <laughs> and I mean, they used Kappa for a couple of months and that's at the NEC because I, I got a, a show there for the BBC. Kappa were great. And I know London All Stars were also rocking that Kappa look early doors. Yeah. But because it became commonplace, we wanted to stand out. So, like I say, I, I drove, that's Bubbles, by the way, or Han Hanifer, the name is. Goldie and, at the back. Um, Goldie at the back. you got Birdie Goldie at the, the front. Back. Birdie, and uh, that is uh, Kiddo, and that's Lou, and that's uh, Freestyle. So, yeah, those are all the b -boys. But 
Uh, I chose this really to illustrate the, the kind of incredible tracksuits that we were given a pick of when we went up to the, the warehouse. And uh, there they are in 1985, a few months on from Electro Rock. And there was a big uh, breaking competition at Wolverhampton Civic Hall, which, uh, which they won. And uh, that's uh, Hannifer upside down. You know, Who, being, who's, uh, who's, who's got that trophy? Uh, that's Goldie holding the trophy. No, who's, uh, who's, who's, who's got it now? Who's got that trophy? Uh, I would think probably uh, Birdie's still got it or, or Hannifer. Mm. Yeah, because um, Hannifer and Birdie are cousins. Yeah, so yeah. It's probably, and uh, Birdie was captain of the B-Boys, so it's probably in uh, his house. I don't know, I've never asked him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's um, uh, sort of uh, the, the Puma stuff again. You see how cool it is? Absolutely amazing. And so this was more... this this was what in eighty five. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's more like eighty six. This actually. Mm. So they were they they they, uh, they were given the, the Puma mid nineteen eighty five, but they they still they were still wearing it in eighty six. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant mm. photograph. I love I love that eighty six style graph as well. I'm really um, keen to talk about this because to me this was a pivotal moment in UK hip hop. There was a jam that was called The Rap Attack at the Shaw Theatre in London in April 1985. And it's when the Bronx River Posse came to London to show us kids to basically fine tune our skills. So basically Bab Bambata come over, he was like overlooking it. And then you had like Lisa Lee, she was teaching us how to MC. You had uh, Prince Ike C, you had DJ Red Alert on showing us how to use the uh, turntables. Jazzy Joyce on the turntables and also Brim. That's one of the first times I met Brim was at the Rap Attack do. So the Rap yeah. Attack at the Shaw Theatre was absolutely incredible. Yeah, and that's uh, another occasion when the, uh, the bus was very helpful. And I, I only got to hear about it on TV AM and Brim was on there. And he was uh, talking to Henry Kelly, I think, uh, about what, you know why he was there and what he was doing, but about his history in New York, and um, he, he publicised the workshops they were doing at the Shaw Theatre. Um, so I said, "Well, we're going." So I got in touch with, you know, the B Boys, and uh, we we went down there, and here were these sort of all-time greats of hip hop, um, just doing workshops basically in all of those things that you you've been talking about. That's why I might because because basically what it what it was, there was like a two day workshop where we was getting taught how to fine tune our hip hop skills. And then after the two day workshop, there was like a big jam in the afternoon yeah. and the night where basically everyone would come together and have this massive jam and you had absolute legends. I mean I've got the original flyer here for I don't know if you can you can't really see this because of the um because obviously I've got my green screen on, but uh, yeah. but basically um, I've got the pro yeah I've got that program as well yeah I think they must have had GLC funding for it uh, to to bring these guys across from from New York um, but the upshot was that you had all of those artists there they were all sort of teaching their particular skills and from from our point of view Goldie was fascinated by. Uh, you know, Brim's the, exper the experiences of his life in, in the Bronx. And uh, so I thought it was really important that those, those two met. And at the time, Brim was uh, being filmed by Dick Fontaine and Gus Corral for a documentary called uh, Bombing, which um, was originally funded by Central TV. Um, so there was an hour, a half hour version on Central and an hour's version on Channel 4 but it focused on the relationship between uh, Goldie and Brim and compared and contrasted their upbringings in the Bronx and in, in, in Heathtown. Is that the first time that Brim and Goldie met? Was that, was that at the rap attack? Yeah, that's right. So we've got Dick Fontaine to, uh, to thank for that in, in some ways. Um, and certainly how the relationship developed because eventually that led to a trip to New York and later on to a big show at uh, Birmingham Central Library with uh, the Tats crew, which you know, Brim was uh, involved with.
and Tats crew, and Tats crew were amazing. I mean, the Tats crew were a South Bronx graffiti crew. You had obviously Brim, Bio, uh, BG, BG183, Nicer. Yeah, I mean, they mm. was a wicked, wicked crew. They were, and they are uh, still around, obviously. Um, in terms of uh, Bio and, and Nicer, they're still painting today. Uh, but they were outstanding in New York. I mean, they were kind of, I think, second generation uh, graffiti artists in uh, in New York because the, the original wave was, you know, during the 70s. So they they were quite young then. But, you know, as the 80s came about, um, Brim and Bio and, and NYSA and BG, they started doing the, the trains and then eventually moved on to Walls. Yeah. So, so we, um... Brim, and Bio, Brim and Bio were good friends, you see, they were best friends best buddies and so um, when the opportunity came around uh, Dick Fontaine wanted to do some filming up in in Birmingham and in Wolverhampton to see what the scene was like and uh, once again fantastic uh, connection I had with the uh, one of the city artists in Birmingham who was doing some work in the Manzoni Gardens in the Bullring and he said well I think they're creating a Chinatown area in uh, the center of Birmingham and uh, they want somebody to do the boards you know to announce the the Chinatown district um, but you know first of all they had to put up the boards and I thought that would be good for a battle so we set up a battle with Brim and Bio of, of Tats crew we had 3D and one of the the Z boys from from Bristol Goldie and Mode and Pride from the Chrome Angels Wow, so, amazing. That's yeah. incredible. Have you got any photographs of that? Yeah, yeah. And it was on bombing as well, you know, which is on YouTube, I, I think. But uh, mm. yeah, so that was all set up by Steve Field, who um, did an amazing mural, conventional one, called City of a Thousand Trades, um, around about the same time that we did this event. They turned the boards around. Goldie, one of his first commissions, was the Chinatown thing. Um, I've got to tell you something about that because he had to do a model for it. He had to, he had to do a, a, a design to show the head of the Chinese community. So he, uh, he said, fine, I can, do, I can do something for you, Martin. So uh, he, he did this elaborate design. It was really long, you know, and um, the whole thing was 100 foot long by 10 foot high. And uh, anyway, I, I didn't bother to look at it. And we went down to the Chinese community centre and it, oh, everybody was, you know, very welcome. Welcome, you know, Goldie, welcome Martin, etc. Welcome West Midland County Council. Uh, right, you know, let's have a look. So he unfurled this um, the design for the thing. And it was fine until you got to the centrepiece. And uh, it was in Hong Kong Harbour and there's a flag in the center of Hong Kong Harbor and it was the Japanese Navy flag and obviously Japan and China are bitter enemies <laughs> and he put you know the Japanese flag right in the middle of Chinese territory so uh, wow. that didn't yeah <laughs> it didn't, well, go, didn't go down too well not initially but he, he had in the end he had a, a sense of humor about it tell you what let's let's take it back to the supreme graffiti team and the wild criminals which, which is quite um yeah. quite it's quite funny really because there was actually um in southeast london there was a legendary <laughs> crew in 1985 also called the supreme team which you had members like uh, the artful dodger crash plaz form jet 302 and they was an absolute amazing crew the supreme team from uh, southeast london so it's quite um mad that there was also a supreme graffiti team also uh, you know from your neck of the woods at the same kind of era yeah i don't know where goldie got the uh, the name from originally but it might have been the uh, the world's famous uh, supreme team the djs who were part of the uh, buffalo gals malcolm mclaren mm. uh, video yeah yeah I, i'm it not sure I mean, but, you can uh, see no, the con connection there. So, yeah, the, the Wild Criminals. Um, after we'd done Throw in the Park, I'd actually commissioned a, a mural by a conventional artist because I people had shown me subway art. And I thought, well, we've got to have something there to represent graffiti. And uh, the manager of the B-Boys, uh, uh, Violet, 
came up to me afterwards and said, uh, well, you realise that that's nothing like the authentic graffiti, don't you? So uh, I said, well, yeah, it was the best I could do. So in the end, uh, she, well, she invited me to come up and meet the B-Boys. And one of the new B-Boys, they changed. The older ones had left, they've got jobs, they've moved outside the area. And they brought in about four new members. Birdie was one of the originals, but Goldie was one of the new ones. And so was uh, Freestyle and so was Kiddo, I think. Bubbles was still there from the old the old uh, B-Boys. And um, so uh, he said, oh, you have a look at some of my designs. So I have a look at the designs. I was really impressed. And he said, well, I've done lots of work throughout Wolverhampton. So I got him in the bus and we drove around. And these are some of the things which uh, they showed me. But uh, a lot of the early graph artists did throw-ups. Um, Goldie was part of Westside originally, and this is where Westside did, did their throw-ups. It's at high-level station, and it connects high-level and low-level stations in, in Wolverhampton. But he was also inspired by Lee, and he did these sort of uh, um, topical, um, you know, semi-political murals. And this one says World War III. And it was about the, the conflict between the US and the USSR at the time, which, um, you know, there were fears in the 80s that it would lead to nuclear conflict. So he's got sort of a Russian nuclear missile and an American one there. So, you know, it, that was typical of the sort of um, social conscience that, that Goldie incorporated into, into his work. And, you know, these were the guys, it was slightly later, this in, in 86. Um, and this was Goldie's uh, paint store, but it, it was actually a, a spare bedroom in, in his flat. And, uh, I mean, he'd grown up in care. Um, <clears throat> and then um, during the, um, uh, sort of when he came out of care, he was given a council flat. And, you know, he turned, turned his, his, his hand to, uh, you know, acquiring cans of paint. I wonder where, oh, I'd love to know where Goldie got his paint from. Do you, do you know what paint? Was he using bunt like then? No, uh, that came later because mm. that that's an, an artist's paint, if you like. It's a very specialist uh, can and they're made in Germany um, and mainly used by interior designers. Um, so I, I got, you know, I think Chrome Angels started using Buntlack first and they gave the idea to Goldie. And I, I just got in touch with Buntlack and I said, uh, you know, we're doing a couple of projects here. Um, can't, you know, got public funding behind them. Well, can you supply us with some? And like with Puma, you know, they came and said, well, help yourself. Mm. So uh, it, it was amazing. They did that for our commissions, but they also did it for uh, Bridlington you know, the uh, International Street Art Contest, which I, I helped to organise. So it's quite a... So, quite, uh, quite anyway, a that, it's quite that's amazing. his uh, paint repository. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite amazing the kind of work that Goldie was coming out with as a graffiti artist, considering the paint wasn't that good. I mean, you have things like car plan, um, yeah. you know, all that early paint. It was very kind of watery and it wasn't very good. So it's amazing what he was coming out with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think at this point where he was doing uh, Catch Me If You Can in the, the underground car park, uh, he would have been using, you know, Holt's car plan at that mm. point. That's incredible. Yeah. When, when, when was that? Um, this was 84. Yeah, late 84, Catch Me If You Can. So they're doing all kinds of improvisational pieces. Uh, this is in the the foyer of Hawthorne House where Goldie had his flat and he, he's done his name there with uh, the O is is the uh, the nozzle of a, a spray can. Um, that's actually 86, it's a little bit later that, but it's it's typical. And uh, what, what they did a little bit later was a stairway to fame. Um, and in the flats you had, you know, the staircase and then between you know, one flight and the next, you had a stairwell. And the, the stairway to fame was actually done on the stairwells uh, but between the floors in uh, He Found Flats. That's another one of Goldie with one of his characters. And he developed this sort of 
persona. He that this was represented him, and um, that that's another one of him, really. So he appears in a guise in in a lot of the uh, uh, paintings that he did, and this one's called "Cry from the Ghetto." Um, and that, there's Birdie and there's Goldie, and this one really did. Um, you know, it was, it's a bit psychic, this one, because it predicted his future fame. Um, one or two of his did as well. There's one called uh, Play for the Future, which he did at Wolverhampton Art Gallery. And that was him on the decks. Uh, and this was well before he became a, a, a DJ. But who, who would you say was kind of inspiring Goldie back in the uh, the early years? Would it be some of those kind of like uh, uh, sort of New York writers, people like Scene, Dundee, and those kind of uh, artists? Yeah, I, Subway Art really. That that was the big uh, inspiration and Style Wars. Mm. Um, but uh, I mean, that lay lay the foundations for what came later. Uh, which was really life-changing for, for him. And that was the trip to New York in uh, 1986. So um, I can talk about that a little bit if you, if you like. Yeah, no, I'd, lo I'd love to. So how, how did that kind of connection, how did the trip to uh, New York happen? Is this the first time that Goldie's ever been to like, New York? Yeah, definitely. And uh, as far as I know, I think Dolby went to New York in the early 80s. But Dolby, Dolby did, yeah. Of... I mean, Dol Dolby was in New York, I think, around 81 and 82. That's why, um, you know... He picked Dol up the breaking. He picked yeah. up the breaking big time, especially when he come back in 83, like the Covent Garden scene and all that. He was, he was like, incredible. Um, but generally speaking, nobody had been to New York, and particularly on, on the graffiti scene. There was definitely a first. And... Uh, Henry Chalk, the, the meeting that uh, Goldie had, I, I showed you one of the projects that uh, Goldie did, and, and Henry came along to um, the Long Lee project in Heathtown in Wolverhampton uh, because he'd heard what Goldie was doing, and he decided he, he needed to meet him because uh, he was doing his next book, which was Spray Can Art, about the spread of the art to the rest of the, uh, the world and he wanted to feature what was going on in the Midlands. So that, that was what kicked it off, and I made the connection with Henry. And um, he'd also met Brim, and Brim, clearly being from New York, he wanted to see what, you know, what life was like and how hip-hop had developed in, uh, in America. So uh, to cut a long story short, I, um, I put the money up for us all to go, that's Birdie, Goldie and myself to go to New York in June 1986 and uh, this is us on getting ready at Gatwick to get on the, the Virgin 99 quid return uh, to, uh, to New York and it flew into Newark in New Jersey so that's them on the plane as Goldie and Birdie with a peace book they 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 must have been absolutely hyped to go to the like the mecca i mean they must have been like on a different level on that plane they must have been ecstatic yes right i hope you enjoyed uh, part two which was absolutely brilliant and uh, in part three we're going to be talking about the amazing trip to the mecca of graffiti and hip-hop when martin goldie and birdie went to new york and visited bronx river we're also going to be talking about when the uh, the tats crew came to uh, the west midlands they went to heave town there was a, a jam in heave town and brim vulcan uh, t kid nysa and bio uh, was there and they left their incredible art on the uh, on the walls and went to town and was let loose with the spray cans and uh, also 3D from Bristol was also there creating some amazing uh, art so we're going to go into detail about that Heath Town Jam as well and uh, obviously the New York trip if you do also go and check out part one as well because we're talking about early hip-hop and b-boy in history and don't forget share this interview share this interview around the socials because there's you know some serious graffiti and hip-hop uh, history being told here and don't forget please leave some comments please like and also subscribe to the channel check out my other interviews out because i've interviewed t kid and loads of other incredible artists too peace from the southeast <laughs>